Stool Pigeon by Kid Creole and the Coconuts on Revenge of the 80s Radio. We've had some of the band's members on the show with us in the past, and I'm happy to say that with me right now on the phone is Kid Creole himself, August Darnell. He has a new album out, and we'll talk about it. Thanks for coming on with me, August. Yes, indeed. Uh, uh, thanks to Modern Science, we can speak from uh, uh, Trollaholm, Sweden, to wherever you are in New York City. Halfway across the world. Yes, indeed. Different time zones, different areas of space. <laughs> That's correct. It's like being in a different universe over here, actually. On Stool Pigeon, August, I understand that you wrote this rather quickly while you read a news story in a waiting room. Yes, indeed. That's a true story. I was actually in a, um, a doctor's office, and the, you know how you have the magazines while you're in the waiting room, and there was a magazine article, and it said Stool Pigeon was the title of it, and it told the story of this guy who went... Uh, uh, underground, and, and he squealed on his mate, and uh, and I found this story fascinating, but I love the title, Stupid, and I had heard this uh, this phrase in a number of movies, old gangster movies from the 40s, and I've always uh, uh, admired the, <laughs> the expression Stupid, and so that magazine article triggered it for me, and I remember leaving the doctor's office, going home, I was living on Central Park South in those days, and writing the song in about five and a half minutes. Five and a half minutes, that's some kind of record. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what they say, the ones that you really, really slave over for days and weeks and months, and I've had those too, uh, nobody, nobody seems to click to those. You know, they're like, uh, oh, that's a nice song, but the ones that you, that you rush off are the ones that become the, uh, the money makers. So it has been in my career, and a lot of other uh, singer-songwriters that I know have said the same thing, actually. And with all those horns, too. You think it would yes, take longer? Well, the horn arrangements, they, they, there's some fantastic horn arrangements on those on the earlier uh, Creole stuff. And uh, we used to uh, we used to use um, Koti Mundi, Sugar Coat of Andy, did a lot of the horn arrangements. We had a guy named Fran, uh, Franzetti, Carlos Franzetti, did some of the horn arrangements. Charlie Lagan did some of the horn arrangements. Ken Fradley did some of the horn arrangements. We had the best guys in the business, business doing those horn arrangements. Because I'm a, big, I'm a big admirer of horns, as you can tell from the early the early records, and I think I got that love from just being a fan of the big bands of the 40s, Duke Ellington and Cab Calloway and Count Basie and the Dorsey Brothers and their orchestras. So all of that stuff comes out in the wash, so to speak. So the heavy big band influence comes into play here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was listening to that music when I was living in the Bronx in the 1950s. My dad was into the big band uh, music, of course. That's how I, I first heard Frank Sinatra was my dad playing the records around the house. Nat King Cole, all the great crooners from the early days. And so we, my brother and I became big fans of the big band. Let's go back to those younger years, kid. Your performance style probably didn't come just out of nowhere. When did you know you wanted to be an entertainer? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, my earliest recollection of what I wanted to be can be traced back to being an actor. Uh, if, if I was asked when I was 12 years old, 13, 14, 15, what do you want to be when you grow up, I would always say I want to be an actor. And I think that my love of drama and of theater is quite evident throughout my career. I think that I got turned on to theater. My first theater production was a school production of The King and I when I was in junior high school. And when I saw that production, I knew right then that was a turning point in my life. I said, in some way, shape, or form, I want to be involved in that magical world that I saw on that stage that could transpose and take me from my audience seat into another world. So I knew at that point that I had to be involved in theater in some way. I didn't know how it would take shape, but I knew it would take place in a theatrical milieu. And so that was my earliest recollection of the transformation, was the King and I, a junior high school production of the King and I. But as I grew up, I became a huge fan of Rodgers and Hammerstein, of course, and Cole Porter and Gershwin and all the early uh, songwriters uh, and, and musical, I should say, writers who contributed to musicals. So, and then, I guess the transformation into rock and roll I can blame on my brother because he was the bohemian in the family and he knew at an early age that he wanted to be a musician. If you asked him at the age of 12, what do you want to be when you grow up? He would say, I want to be a musician, whereas I would say I wanted to be an actor. So the combination of the two actually worked to our benefit. Before Kid Creole and the Coconuts were formed, you and Andy Hernandez, later known as Cody Mundi, were in Corey Day's Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah band. But talk about the days before Dr. Buzzard. 
What were you doing before you got that big break? Well, before Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah Band, uh, my brother and I fashioned ourselves to be songwriters. We were influenced by uh, the British invasion, primarily. Um, Lennon and McCartney as songwriters was a turning point for us because we realized these were, uh, this was a self-contained band. And, and unlike some of the other bands that we admired, uh, who had to go outside of themselves to find songwriters, this band was self-contained because the, the members of the band, Lyndon McCartney, even George Harrison, uh, were writing the songs. My brother and I, this, this set off a light bulb in our heads because we said, wow, we don't have to go to outside writers. We can be the writers ourselves. So the early days before we found fame with the Vanna Band was basically a number of bands we had formed and, and played in neighborhood uh, community centers. We took a gig anywhere we could find it. We used to go. My dad used to drive us upstate New York to um, the camp. There was Camp Monroe, and there was Lake Arrowhead and places like that. My dad was the manager in those days. He'd just put the drum kit in the car and the, and the amps and the guitars and drive us to these gigs. So it was all about performing in some way, some shape on our time off. Because don't forget, we were, of course, we were in school during this period. We're talking about teenage years. And, uh, and then I went to college and decided that I was going to be quite serious about being a drama major. So I, I majored in drama at Hofstra University in Long Island. And my brother stayed in Manhattan and just pursued music. And I remember before Savannah Man struck, I remember looking at his lifestyle and being a bit envious and jealous of his lifestyle because while I was going off to Hofstra University and working around the clock on my, my papers and my homework, et cetera, et cetera, he was living at home making music all day long. And I, I should also point out he was surrounded always by busy of beautiful women. So I, I grew up right. jealous and I was wondering, what am I doing wrong? <laughs> but um, I pursued this whole um, educational thing and, and graduated from Hofstra University uh, as an English major. Okay, I had switched from drama to English uh, in my third year. And, um, and I would always just play with, with his band on the weekend. And even before it was called Dr. Buzzer's Savannah Band, we had a number of different bands and different names. Uh, one was Unum Mundo, Latin for One World, because we always had this concept of, of uh, being very eclectic and mixing different styles together. So before Savannah Band, there was just two brothers dreaming of success as songwriters slash entertainers. Dr. Buzzard's original Savannah Band was one of the icons of the 70s and had a few mainstream hits, but what made you want to go out and lead your own ensemble? Uh, yeah, the, the, the whole notion of jumping ship is what I, I used to call it with the Savannah Band. So Stoney got very lucky because he had a girlfriend by the name of Corey Day, and Corey Day became the lead singer of the Savannah Band. And Corey Day was the, the best choice in the universe for lead singing the band because she had also been inspired and motivated by the singers of the 40s. She was a huge fan of Billie Holiday and Ella Fitzgerald, Peggy Lee, all the great crooners. And you could hear her in her style that she had worshipped these singers, but she put her own stamp on it. So it was a perfect, perfect vehicle to sing Stoney's melodies. Uh, and, and I should point out to, to, uh, to enunciate my lyrics, she was just a great stylist. And what happened was, Stoney and I, as songwriters, being brothers, I was growing in leaps and bounds in this time, because after we had our success with the first uh, Savannah Band record, which was uh, amazing that we would have a success on the first, first time out of the box, so to speak, we had a number one record with Cherche La Femme and a gold album with the first album. So we got big-headed quickly, and we made a lot of money, and we got famous. Uh, at a relatively early age, we were still in our twenties, and as we as we grew as a band, Stoney took the band out to California to do the second album, and uh, and then the third album came along, and I was growing restless because I wanted to be more than just a uh, lyricist, uh, but Stoney was very very strict about the roles we would play in this band. He was the band leader, and 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 all kudos to him. No one could have done it better than he. Uh, Corey Day was, was the shunter. She was the lead singer. Uh, Kochi Mundi was the vibe player. Uh, Mickey was the drummer. And I was the bass player. 
Uh, but in addition to being the bass player, I was also the lyricist, because we were also songwriters. I only did the music, I wrote the lyrics. Uh, and so as I grew and wanted to do more than just write lyrics and play bass and sing background, I should point out, mm-hmm. uh, Stoney was very strict about saying, no, 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 you have to be a lyricist. Uh, there's no room for you writing music. I write the music. So basically, my uh, escape from that prison of uh, limitation was to create my own band where I could be the boss, where I could write the music, as well as the lyrics. So it was all about showing Big Brother that I could do it on my own. That's how Kid Creole got formed. That's right. You can't keep a good man down. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yes, that's how the adventure started. I must admit, in the early days, I was a bit wary about having jumped ship because now I was the, the leader of this new outfit. There was no excuse. You know, as a right-hand man, you didn't have to take the responsibility for uh, failure. Uh, you, took the, you took the accolades for success, but you also had to take the accolades for failure when you're a leader. And I was in the early days, I was wondering if I had done the correct thing, because now the weight of the entire project was on my shoulders. Thank God I had partners. Well, I had um, Shizuko Vandy, uh, became Koti Mundi, and he came along with me when I jumped ship. And uh, then I met Adriana, which was another stroke of good fortune because she was from Switzerland. So that introduced me to the whole European thing. And Kid Crow became hugely successful in Europe. So, uh, so I think I was extremely lucky in having Koti Mundi jump ship with me and then meeting Adriana. And that they became the nucleus of Kid Creole and the Coconuts. And we're going to talk about Kid Creole and the Coconuts straight ahead on Revenge of the 80s Radio. Plus, we'll play some new tracks and converse about his new album, I Wake Up Screaming.